أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <تصفيق> الحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحصي نعماءه العادون ولا يؤدي حقه المستحدون الذي لا يضركه بعد الحمم ولا يناله غوص الفطن ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب قلوبنا والطبيب نفوسنا والشفيع ذنوبنا سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم وآل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين صاحب العص والزمان خليفة الرحمن إمام الإنس والجان ولعن الله وعداهم جمعين إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وكان الناس أمة واحدة صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم <coughs> The Quranic concept of one nation has been our ongoing topic. Tonight is lecture number six. The premise and the attempt that now that I have made with all of you in the past six nights <coughs> is to examine the principles behind the 213th verse of Surah Al-Baqarah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us that you were at one moment, you as a human being, as the insan, you were one nation. <coughs> you were tolerant, you were cohesive, you were cooperative, and you worked together. And we have been now talking about um, uh, various muqaddamati preliminary discussions, like what, is, what, what a nation means, and the idea of collectivism, and... Then we looked into the tafsiri discussion of this uh, verse from tafsir al-Mizan uh, of Alama Tabatabai, rahmatullah alayh, where he talks about the idea that in the beginning, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instilled and provided this knowledge of preservation of the human being, meaning that the human being understood that it had to preserve itself and that built into the fitrah and the innate disposition of the human being is its own preservation. As I mentioned, you and I, we go to um, very, very far lengths to ensure that we preserve our own existence, be it our physical body, be it our health, and sometimes, of course, be it our spiritual dimension as well, with the avoidance of sin, and with the avoidance of mistakes, etc., etc. Part of that ilm and knowledge that the human being got in the beginning now, and Alama takes us all the way back in the beginning phases of the human history, was the fact that it began to realize, the human began to realize that all these various tools around me can be used, should be used, and were ultimately used to preserve my own existence. So, you know, the knives and the ladders and the boats and the animals and all of those were made to preserve my own existence. Eventually, it, it also understood that, that my fellow human being could also be used, exploited, tapped into to do nothing else but to preserve my own existence. <clears throat> now, what began to happen as Alama described in Tafsir, and yes, I'm repeating myself, but you, you know me very well. I like to go through my recaps. It's important for me. And that is that um, it began to realize, the human began to realize, if I'm exploiting and using those things around me to get to my preservation, then I'm equally being used as well by my fellow human being to uh, preserve their own respective existence, which is fine. <clears throat> it's okay. And so to avoid the, um, um, the stripping of rights, to ensure that there is a society of harmony, and of cohesion, and that everyone has their own right, um, <clears throat> law and order was instilled inside society, protecting everyone's respective rights. And so long as each human now upheld their own respective rights and looked after the rights of others, there was social justice, there was cohesion, there was any, there, there were, um, there were no issues. And to ensure that the 
law was established correctly, the, prof the, the, the prophets were sent down by the Holy Prophet, by, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? Now, what ends up happening, however, is that somewhere along the line, <clears throat> the greed, the ego, the, the satanic, the animalistic damage on the human being begins to, uh, begins to uh, rear its ugly head. And now rights are being, of course, strips and stripped and rights are being taken away. And people now are being uh, taken advantage of. Right? And when enough people now begin to start to think, wait, this person in front of me is trying to take advantage of me. And they stop and think, well, they're being successful in that immoral, illegal act, and why can't I do it? And so it becomes a domino effect, anarchy in, 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 ensues, and thus now the fall of society. And as I enter now the second half of the Ashra now, and, I, and, I, and, and this remainder week, I'm, I'm with all of you until, you know, uh, until the day of our Ashura, um, <clears throat> We want to look at those factors, uh, firstly those factors that caused us to move from that one cohesive nation, that one collective na uh, nation, where everybody actually was working together to not only elevate themselves, but elevate those around them. Where do we go from that to what we have today? Right? We have today. A, the, 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 the struggle that is consistent throughout, the, throughout history and time, even today, is social justice. <clears throat> we just cannot get this system right. We cannot get this, uh, this, uh, this reality correct. No matter how hard the human being tries, it tries to, to, to accomplish that sense of justice without any sort of interference and, and reliance and dependence on God. But we failed, right? We have failed. Look at what's happening right now in, uh, in the U.S. in terms of the anti-racism movement. Look, what, look what's happening all over the world <clears throat> in terms of our brothers in Yemen, in Palestine, in Iraq, and Syria, right? It is a mess. It's, it's, it's anarchy. It's chaos, right? The ones who should be establishing the government and the ones who should be establishing law, they themselves are corrupt. And that's all, of course. We talked about that a couple of days ago. So that triggered a discussion now, a subtopic now that we began yesterday, that what are those factors <clears throat> that, have, that have contributed to this fall? One of them that I introduced yesterday was elitism, right? This, this, this mahsus we have, as we say in Urdu, this hisse baratari, right? This hisse avzaliyat, this... Uh, the, this sense of the fact that I am better and I'm higher and I'm elite. And one thing that I really wanted to ensure that everyone took home yesterday was the fact that we should, we should absolutely strive to be the elite, to be the pious, to be the ones who are distinct, to be the ones who have the favilat, no doubt about it. But we have to earn that with our merit, with our actions, with our iman, with struggle, the elitism that I'm referring to yesterday, and also I'm going to include, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to expand on that tonight as well, is that elitism that we feel where I have every right to look down on this person, I have every right to feel like I'm higher than that person with no merit whatsoever. I haven't achieved anything, right? Either genetically, by mistake, something that was given to me by accident, I used that to say, oh, because I'm this, I, I should look down on you. Baba, you didn't do anything to earn what that, that, that is. Whether the examples I gave was the color of your skin. Did you have a choice now to be born with the shade of color you have on your skin? Did you have a choice now to be born, let's say, a male or a female? Did you have a choice to be born a Sayyid or a not Sayyid? Did you have a choice to be born, let's say, a Shia or a not Shia? All those things that you're initially born with now, right, are things that are meritless. Okay. And the very first individual and first existence to show this false sense of elitism was shaitan. This is a satanic disease we have. Right? His focus only on this uh, refusal to bow down to Adam was something that was Zahiri, apparent on the outside. Right? He simply said that, look, I am this, you are this. 
Right. When you know, and when in reality, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, the entire masala and the, and the entire issue of bowing down to Adam had nothing to do with what was used to create Adam. Right. وَإِذَا سَوَيْتُهُ وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِي فَقَعُوا لَهُ سَاجِدِينَ The Qur'an says, Allah says, when I gave this Adam sur, meaning surat, they say, in Urdu, that comes from sur in Arabic, meaning what? The idea of form, face, shape, color, a, a, an apparent outwardly materialistic form. وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِي And I blew in him from my spirit. At that moment, I've explained this process to you guys before, and that is that you know there is a, a, an Arabic grammar principle that talks about you know iva and fa, iva and fa. Meaning in, in in English we have if this happens, then this happens. If I do this, then do this. For example, okay. So sometimes you know I I, I like to have uh, you know the uh, um, uh, the lights off. Okay, the lights off during Masai. Okay, and my um, and my, my 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 neighbors are doing renovations right now. Yes, as you can hear, I think they're drilling something. Anyways, <clears throat> so when we say when this happens, right? Do this. So, for example, in baseball, they have they have signals, right? The third base coach now, before the batter goes up, and if someone's on base, he looks to the third base coach, and you know they have all sorts of signs, and they have these signs that are only exclusive to the team. If I do this, for example, it means to do what? To take a pitch. Don't swing at the ball. If I do this, for example, it means that uh, the man on first is going to steal second, right? It's a hit and run. So do your best to make contact, for example, okay? When I do this, you do this, right? For example, I tell communities that I like the, I like the lights off during Masai. I prefer that, right? So when I take off my hat, you know it's Masai. The moment I take off my hat, make sure the lights are off, okay? If this happens, then this happens. When this happens, then this happens, okay? It's important now that the fa the fa in Arabic, and I'll explain using this verse I just read for you. <clears throat> the fa in Arabic is placed precisely, precisely in this verse very carefully. So let's examine the verse through the Arabic grammar lens. It says, Ida sawaituhu, when I gave this Adam surah, form, physical form, meaning I made him out of clay. I gave him, I gave, I, I gave him limbs and eyes and nose and all that kind of stuff. And I blew in his spirit. The moment that Allah says, and I blew into his spirit, then the, the, the letter fa comes. Then fall down into sajda. Look at where the fa comes. It does not say, When I gave Adam this surah, this form, then fall to sajda. No. Allah is making a very, very clear point in this verse that, look, this hukum that I'm giving you as the existence of mine to do sajda to Adam comes after the fact that I blew into his spirit. After the fact that I blew into his spirit. Not at the moment that I gave him surah or form or, or, or clay or nothing. Meaning what? Meaning to Allah, the importance is the what? The batin of Adam. The hidden of Adam, the ruh of Adam. That was what made Adam qabil sajda. Not the idea of this form, but shaitan didn't understand that. When he was asked, why didn't you do sajda? Ana khayru minhu. Right? Khalaktani min nar wa khalaktahu min teen. He reduced the entire masala of sujood to nothing but dirt and fire. Meaning what? That, you know, I embedded him because I'm made of fire. You can see fire, you can see clay, those things that are physical, right? You, you didn't, you know, you, if you had, if you were, if shaitan was smart, okay? <laughs> if shaitan was smart, shaitan would sit there and say, look, the reason why I don't want to bow down to Adam was because I have 4,000 years of worship on, uh, in, 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 in my resume, he has nothing. That might have been a, 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 a better argument. As the, but he didn't say that. He didn't say that. He went directly to what? To the uh, color of his skin in today's lingo. He went directly to the physical form. I'm fire, he's clay. I'm fire, he's clay. Baba, you being fire is nothing that you earned. God made you from fire. 
you know, Adam's Baltari, Adam's Azalir, Adam, the fact that Allah now is making him higher than you, is not based on clay, Baba. It's based on the fact that he, what? Inside of him is the potential, Bilquwa, to be my representative, okay? This entire elitism is actually a sunnah and a sira of shaitan. Remember, meritless elitism. Where I believe I'm a higher than you because I am I a, 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 a lighter color of skin than you. Right? I believe I'm higher than you because I come from a certain city in India and Pakistan. Because I make a certain amount of money. <clears throat> I believe I'm better than you because I'm ta physically taller than you. I may be considered to be more beautiful than you. Right? There's an ego about those who are considered to be beautiful inside our community, physically beautiful. Right? They walk around like they have all this confidence. Right? As opposed to somebody who's considered not to be attractive, they have you know, a lot of self-esteem issues. <clears throat> Right. So, you know, the point I was making yesterday, and, and, and you know, it, it's, it, it's a very vital point, was the fact that one of the, one of the dimensions of elitism is spiritual elitism. And part of spiritual el elitism I coined was divine fantasies. We live in this fictitious fantasy world where we have this, this, this jannat waiting for me, but all meritless. And we examine the, 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 the saying from Imam Ali that don't be like those Don't be like those who have hopes of the Akhirat, who have this, all this Umid, 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 Jannat, Jannat, Jannat is waiting for me. We do nothing for it. We do nothing for it. Okay? I want to further along tonight's discussion by looking at the idea of spiritual elitism by association elitism by association and another another very difficult conversation <clears throat> another difficult conversation that I must have with all of you and I'm going to say it one more time I've earned my stripes with all of you okay I'm not a new face to any of you okay I have earned my right to say this okay after several years of, 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 of trying to break down the base and break down the base now alhamdulillah there should be no um, shuck and doubt on what my niyat is, inshallah. I've earned that. I've earned that. Having said that, we believe, and I'm going to now specifically come down to the Shia nation. There are some of us who believe that I am elite only because I'm Shia. Or because I'm associated with the Ahlubayt. Or because I have a Sayyid last name, that, that, that if I trace my shajara and my family tree back, it goes all the way back to the 7th, 6th, 6th Imam, for example, for me, for example. And because of that sheer association now, I am elite. Right? So there are individuals, let's say, who are sons of doctors, sons of doctors, haven't opened up a medical textbook in their life, but because they're sons of doctors, right, they, they think they can hand out prescriptions. Okay. <laughs> there are sons of ulama who believe they can hand out fatwas. Okay. There are sons of, let's say, for example, presidents who believe they can sit in the White House, for example. Okay. All that by association. No merit whatsoever. Nothing you've earned. You have no right to sit there. Yeah, your dad's a doctor. Yes, your father is an alim. Yes, your mother, let's say, for example, is an alima. But you aren't. <laughs> you aren't. And just the fact that you share a dinner table and you share, you share a roof doesn't make you an alim, doesn't make you a doctor, doesn't make you somebody who's worthy of the, of, of the merit that they have, not what you have. Unless, of course, you follow in their footsteps and you go down the medical field, or, for example, you, know, you go to the hausa and you become an alim or an alima, inshallah. Okay? So this association is huge. <clears throat> and we are always, you know, we're, we're, we, are, we are amazing at name dropping. Because we want that respect without all the work. And I'm sorry, I don't mean to be negative. I, I'm not a negative person. All of you know me, I'm not an, an, a negative person. I like to be gra glass half full, upbeat, this and that, right? I always try to be in a, in a great mood, okay? But it, there is this level of the fact that sometimes we're looking for this respect from the people without having earned that respect, okay? So if that means that, for example, if I'm, and, and small things, if an alim comes into town, right? I know that alim, 
right? Maybe I, I knew him from before, maybe, you know, he stayed with me, whatever the case may be. I want to make sure everyone knows that I know this alim. So I'll come and sit beside him, I'll give him an extra hug when he comes in, you know, wherever he goes, I'll go with him, right? When people respect, when people see him, they'll see me. When they, when, when they sit with him, they'll sit with me, right? Uh, I'll, I'll drop him off, I'll pick him up, you know, this and that, blah, blah, blah. If somebody wants to meet him, I'll say, look, if you want to meet him, call me, I'll arrange for it, right? In the process, we want the fact that I, you know, I want the respect, but in actuality, it's respect that they have, right? You just want to be associated. You just kind of want to walk in the shadows, right? You want to be able, you want to name drop it. Oh, I know Fulan. Yeah, yeah, I know Fulan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Him and I go way back. Oh, I'm no bachman gidos to mashallah. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. It still doesn't make you an alim, right? That's this association that we have, right, is great, but that should trigger you to be a better person. If you're associated with amazing, pious people, it doesn't make you pious until you actually gain piety. Makes sense, right? Okay. Now, the problem is that we actually, as Shias, we believe we are elite by association alone with the imams. I am a Shia of Ali. I am an Azadar of Hussein. I am a Muntadhir of Imam Mahdi. Right? So that association is there. Great. But those right now are only names. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. They're only names. Until we actually do something. Right? Until we actually do something. Because the reality is that in my grave, when I go in my grave, no one's going to ask me um, what my last name is. No one's going to ask me what, what my last name is. Oh, oh, uh, I'm Jafri. Oh, you're Jafri. Yeah. Aye, aye. The, the, you're over here. You, there's an alag intizam for you, Jafri Zab. Please, there's a different uh, setup for you. Please come have a seat here. No, 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 don't ask him a question. He's Jafri, yaar. Jafri, yaar. Come, 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 please have a seat. Have a seat. Meanwhile, Mr. Jafri has done nothing in his whole life. He's lived the life of, of, of shaitan his entire life. But hey, hey, I'm a Jafri. Right? My brother, you were born into a Jafri, right? I mean, genetics gave you your last name. You didn't do anything about it. Don't tell me, the, oh, because, and the reason why you have Jafri, Jafri, because it's Jafar, and Jafar has respect for our sixth month. That association now comes down, and, and you take it, right? You're like, oh, okay, take it, all right, sure, yeah. Oh, this is a very nice setup. Uh, Jafri, yeah. Right? So we kind of believe that. We kind of walk around and say, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a Jafri. By association only. No one in my grave will ask me what's your last name. Even in Talqeen, and a lot of you will argue with me, in Talqeen, and I ask you, please, if there's any feedback, you have my number. If not, there are people in your community who can get, 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 get you my number or my email address. By all means, please reach out to me. Please reach out to me. <coughs> um, I lost my train of thought. So in the grave now, even this idea of Talqeen, okay? Yes, we, we, you know, when, when we bury, when we bury uh, the Mayyat and the Marhum, there is a Talqeen red, a Talqeen red, right? That's where, you know, um, the waris or the, well, or, 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 yeah, the, the individual who is the waris of the Marhum, they shake the shoulders, right? Right? We talk about the idea that, look, when you go into uh, the grave and those, uh, and those, and those malaki muqarriban, those close angels will ask you, right? La uh, takhaf, don't be scared, this is your answer. Your imam is uh, Imam Ali, your imam is Imam Hassan, your imam, and all 12 names. Giving basically the answers to the questions down there. The problem is what we don't understand, what I don't at least understand is that when I'm in the grave, I've entered the realm of the other world. I've left this alim in mithal. I've left this alim in nasud. I've left this materialistic world, right? <clears throat> and my body now is no longer functioning because my soul's been separated from my body, right? So the questions being asked of me in the grave are not to my physical body. They're to my soul, right? So if that, if that, if that deen, if that faith has penetrated my body into my soul, I'll give the right answers. If it hasn't, then I'm stuck. I'm stuck. Right? Look, I'll give you a, a very simple example, right? Salat, salat, namaz, salat. Okay? Imam Khamenei rahmatullah alayhi has a beautiful, beautiful discussion in, uh, in Adab al-Salat. Okay? That book is so incredible that, you know, the etiquettes of salat is the fact that <coughs> He spends the first 17, 18 chapters of the, of the book simply preparing us to even come and into the mahrab and begin salat. Does not start off by talking about niyat and takbirat al-ahram and qiyam and ruku and sujood. No. He says there's a lot of preparation in order for us 
to make this Salat a Mi'raj, an ascension, a lot of preparation. One of them is to understand what Salat is. He says Salat has a, a pivotal role to play in the building of your Akhirat. Provided, provided Salat penetrates the physical realm and gets into your soul. If it's just, you know, Allah Harp, Allah Harp, and that's it, then, you know, it attaches itself to the body. It becomes a bodily worship. Meaning what? So long as your limbs are working, you're performing the act. It's not getting into the heart. The reason why that's important is because when the body is buried into the ground, the salat that you performed in this world is also buried with that body. When the body decays, the salat decays. The problem is your soul moves on, but your soul moves on without the salat because the salat only attaches itself to the body. But if somebody, alhamdulillah, was to you know, pray salat with huzur qalb the presence of the heart, such that it penetrates the body, gets past the body, surpasses the body, attaches itself to the soul. Now, as the soul moves around in the akhirat, the salat goes with it, wherever it goes. And that's what you want. You want the salat to, to what? To um, witness on your behalf in the hereafter. That talqeen where we are telling the mate, look, you're going to be asked who is your imam, or who, wh where is your qibla, who, what is your book, who is your prophet, these are your answers. That's fine, provided that all of these things from the qibla to the prophet to the imam to the Qur'an, what? Penetrated the body and got to the soul. Then will Aram say, will say, yes, this is my answer, this is my answer, this is my answer. Otherwise, hadith tells us that 700 years, 700 years will pass. And the mayat in the grave won't be able to ask min rabbuk, who is your Lord? 700 years, and they won't be able to answer the question, who is your Lord? Because you're not asking the mind, you, you're asking the hearts. And if that rabb didn't penetrate the body into the, into the soul, it won't have an answer for you. So don't argue with me that, oh, you know, wait a second now, you know, we actually prepare the mayat before going into the grave, talqeen, these are your answers, because you are a Shia. Well, the example I'll give you is a very simple one, okay? You have two patients who are sick, okay? <laughs> it's a very good example, it's Shaheed Mutahari's example. Two patients that are sick. One patient goes to the expert doctor, the best doctor in town, the best doctor in town. The second patient goes to a normal everyday doctor, nothing too special about him. The first patient tells him, tells the, the, the great doctor that uh, these are my symptoms. The second patient goes to the normal doctor, says these are my, uh, these are my symptoms. Okay? The first elite doctor gives his patient a prescription. The second normal everyday doctor gives his respective patient or her respective patient a prescription. So now they both come out of their respective doctor's offices, both patients who are sick, with prescriptions. And both of them don't fulfill that prescription. Weeks pass, they're both sick. Weeks pass. They're both sick. The one that went to the elite doctor starts to complain. How could I be sick like him? I went to the elite doctor. I should be somebody who is, who has the best of health. I should be somebody who is recovered by now. I shouldn't be at the same health level as this guy. He went to a normal everyday walk-in clinic doctor. I went to a specialist. I went to the best of the best of the best. Baba, the only way that you would be healthier than him is if you what? If you acted on the prescription that the doctor gave you. We go to the Ahl al -Bayt. <clears throat> We beg the Ahl al -Bayt. We cry for the Ahl al -Bayt. We celebrate the birth of the Ahl al -Bayt. We acknowledge Ghadir wasn't an announcement of friendship or anything else besides the wilayat of Amir al-Mu'mineen. I understand that, that the plains of Karbala didn't host some battle between two shahzalis, na'udhu billah, or this was some, you know, some gharelu jagra, this is some family issue between, you know, Ma'aviyah and Ali that trickled down to their sons. No, this was a haq and batil battle. I understand that. That's why every single Muharram, I had this harara, I had this movement. Even in a COVID-19 coronavirus Muharram, there's this harara that I'm seeing in the past six days that's incredible, legit, incredible. 
But that is you going to the doctor. That same Imam Hussein that we cry for, the same Imam Ali that, the Imam Ali that we celebrate, have, have given us prescriptions and prescriptions and prescriptions. Just like other leaders and other khulafa have given their respective followers prescriptions. But what makes us elite is not the prescription in our hand. It's not the fact that I actually called and made an appointment with the doctor. What makes me elite, what makes me healthier than this individual is the fact that I follow the prescription man. That prescription that this elite doctor prescribed is, is, is absolutely the best prescription you can have. The difference is not in the patient's but in the prescription. So if you want to be elite and healthier than that patient, follow the elite prescription. Then you become elite. Not before that. But this idea of simple association, <clears throat> without merit, without action, I'm sorry. We're in for a shock. We're going to be in for a surprise. Look at this hadith. I remember, I promised you guys yesterday that I was going to present to you a tradition. Okay, And it is, it is a very profound one and one that I really want all of you, especially myself, to digest and understand. <laughs> it's incredible. Incredible words of the Holy Prophet. <clears throat> and to set up this, 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 this hadith and tradition, this happened in the eighth year after Hijrah when the Prophet and, and, and his followers conquered Mecca from Abu Sufyan. After the conquest of Mecca, the Prophet now, you know, this was a monumental event in history, Islamically. This was the announcements of the, of the victory and the arrival of Islam now. He now had a stronghold, meaning the deen had a stronghold over Medina and Mecca both. And so he realized that, you know, there'll be people who feel good about themselves and feel like, you know what, I've succeeded. <clears throat> so what does he do? He um, gathers the Bani Hashim. He gathers his family members, his close relatives, okay? And they have a conversation, okay? And I'm usually, you know, you, you know me enough that I don't usually have an iPad or an iPhone up here or my notes up here. You know, I, I, just, I just can't do it. But for this one, I'm going to read verbatim, if you don't mind, from my phone. And I'm sorry if that's distracting. After, after, after he calls the sons of Hashim and the sons of Abdul, Abdul Muttalib and, 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 and the Bani Hashim, now they're all around him. Obviously, they're on a, they're on a high. Everyone is, is in a very celebra celebratory mood. You know, we, we did this. We conquered, we conquered the beast. We, we, we conquered Abu Sufyan. The Prophet then brings them back to reality. Keep in mind, my topic tonight is elite by association. Okay? He says, Inni Rasulullah ilaykum. <laughs> Every single word is revolutionary. I am for you the Prophet of God, the Rasul of Allah. Okay. Inni la shafiqu alaykum. I'm one of your well wishers. I do du'a for you. I pray for you. I really wish you would nothing but success for you. Look at how he's setting this up. And then he drops the he drops a bomb. <laughs> he says, "La taqulu inna Muhammadan minna." Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala. La taqulu Muhammad. La taqulu inna Muhammadan minna. Don't say that Muhammad is from us. Allah Allah Akbar. Oh man. <clears throat> For surely from my friends, my awliya, either from my family or those who are outside of me. Okay? Either those who are my friends or those who are outside of me. Right? Min kum from me. Or, or min ghayrikum, from outside of me. But the only ones that are considered to be my awliya, awliya'i, that ya at the end means him. It's a possessive pronoun, mine. 
my friends are nobody but illal muttaqin except for the pious ones and then he goes on <laughs> and this is all you know connected to yesterday's discussion the prophet was scared he didn't want to create these divine fantasies you know with divine fantasies comes what comes a sense of complacency he didn't want them to think for a moment, we conquered Mecca, we're good. We're standing beside the Prophet of Allah, we're the Bani Hashim, we're no doubt, we're elite because he's Hashimi, we're Hashimi, right? We conquered Mecca, this is ours, us now, this is it, we're good now. And now all of a sudden you let your guard down. You think, okay, that's it. This world I'm successful and for sure in the hereafter, I'm also very successful. That's why he says, فَلَا, فلا تَعْتُنِي يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ تَحْمِلُونَ الدُّنْيَا عَلَى رِقُوبِكُمْ or رِقَابِكُمْ, sorry. Do not come to me. Don't come to me. Don't come to me with, on the day of judgment, with the weight of the, of, of the dunya on your shoulders. Don't come to me on the day of judgment with the weight of the dunya on your shoulders. Meaning what? Sins and mistakes and love and possessiveness and attachment to the dunya on your shoulders while you're walking towards me while what while what happens while others now are, are have the weight of the akhirat on their shoulders what's he talking about here he's saying look i don't want you and remember he's addressing his direct family his bani hashim the sons of abdul muttalib okay the hashimis he specifically gathered that group he says look he goes i am your prophet I wish well for you, but don't sit there and, and don't, don't and, and you know, pardon my paraphrasing, but don't sit there and tell, and, and tell people, oh, you know, I, I'm with Muhammad, I'm with Muhammad, I'm with Muhammad. Uh, you see him? Yeah, I'm with him. Don't do that. My awliya, my friends are no one illa al-muttaqeen. And don't come to me on the day of judgment, yahmaloon al-dunya, with this weight of the shoulders, ala riqabikum, on your shoulders. On your shoulder, meaning you're carrying the burden and the weight of your sins, and you're like, oh, oh, Prophet Muhammad, come, come, uh, come, come. You're Hashmi, I'm Hashmi. Look at all this weight. Can you please help me with this weight? While other individuals, other people who are outside of my uh, my, my tribe, outside the Bani Hashim, they what? al They carry the weight of the akhirah. Meaning what? They're set. They did their work. They did what they're supposed to do in this in this dunya to uh, to be able to get to the hereafter. They're coming. As well, but they don't have the weight of the dunya, they have the weight of the akhirat. Don't come to me. Basically, don't expect me to come and, and alleviate you of that. Now again, obviously, we have shafa'at, intercession. Of course, that's, I know that's where your mind is going. For sure, that's where your mind is going. But I want all of you to realize, and my hat just turned around. I want all of you to realize that, you know, that shifa'at and intercession has to be earned and merit. And if this was a, a class on shifa'at, you know enough. Alhamdulillah, you're very, very well read. You know enough that intercession and the shifa'at of the Ahlul Bayt is not the fact that we live our life as shaitan, we end up in heaven. Sorry. We have to earn that shifa'at. He says, don't come to me with that on your shoulders, while others come to me with, um, uh, with um, uh, the weight of the... Of the, of the hereafter, right? Allah wa inni qada a'udhartu fi ma baini wa baynakum. There's nothing left between you and me. Meaning what? I've given you everything you you uh, everything for your success. Everything for your success. There's nothing left. There's no there, there, there's no excuses left. Meaning I you know there, there, it's not like you can come on the day of judgment. Oh my goodness, what? You're gonna question me for my salat? No one told me this. I'm going to be judged for my actions. Wait a second. Nobody told me this. This, this prophet of yours, God, he never once said that, you know, we'll be held accountable, that this is the day of, of, of hisab and that's a day of amal in the dunya. He says, no. There's no uzr. There's no excuses between you and me now. I've given you everything. al yoma akmanta lukum dinakum. Your deen's been perfected. You know everything. Eight, of, eight year after Hijri, conquering Mecca, talking to his direct tribesmen, his Bani Hashim. <laughs> and then he says beautifully, and this is the crux of the entire tradition, the last portion. He goes, Oh, 
I have my deeds, I have my a'mal, you have your a'mal. Sounds kind of cruel, right? Sounds kind of like, well, he's just going to leave them on the day of judgment? No, of course not. If they're worthy of his intercession, he'll, he'll intercede. Of course he will. But you have to be worthy of it, right? You have to be worthy of it. If you're worthy of the extra marks at the end, end of the semester, the, 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 the prof will give you those extra marks. doesn't want to see you fail. But you have to be worthy of it. So work very hard throughout the semester. You work very hard in this dunya. I work very hard in this dunya. Even the Hashemis back then work very hard in this dunya, and they're worthy, and they've earned with merit the shafa'at of, the, of Rasulullah, they'll get it. But he's talking about the fact that if you come to me on association alone, carrying the weight of this dunya on your shoulders, I can't help you. Don't come to me and say, Muhammadan minna, he, he's from me. He, he's, he, we're same tribe, same tribe, same tribe. So? Inna li amali wa wa lakum amalakum. For me is my amal. I'm not the judge now. For you is your amal. Okay? We're not going to be individuals. <laughs> Who in, 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 in the grave, if somebody comes and asks me a, a, a question, you know, um, we'll say, uh, you know, um, you, you don't need to ask me any questions in the grave. I, I'm actually a Hashemi. Um, you ever heard of, 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 of the Holy Prophet? You know who Muhammad is? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm the same tribe as him. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a Hashemi. <laughs> okay. Good for you, sir. Uh, let me ask you a few questions. <laughs> how was your Salat? <laughs> how, how are you with your family? It's a, t- it's a difficult thing to, 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 to digest. If we want to be associated with uh, the Ahlul Bayt, has to be through the Maidan of Amal. Not on paper alone. This is not some field to fill out in the form. Religion, Shia. Oh, okay. Jannati, no. <laughs> it has to be earned. has to be earned. We have to find out what the language of love of the Ahlul Bayt are. We have to find out what it is that the Ahlul Bayt want from us and do that. <clears throat> many, many people claim to be the Shi'as of Ali. Many people claim to be the lovers of Imam Hussein. When it came down to, 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 to them supporting Imam Hussein in this mission towards Karbala, only 72, max 100. How could the grandson of the Holy Prophet only have a max amount of people of 100? How could someone like Yazid and Ibn Ziyad and these individuals who are satanic men be able to convince 30,000 individuals to come to Karbala? How is that possible? And then they have the gall to claim that we love Hussein. Then they have the gall now to cry when the Qafla comes back from Medina. When Imam Sajjad describes what happened to his father on the day of Ashura, then they cry. Those tears, are fine, you cry, yes, I cry as well. But those tears should what? Should melt the heart, soften the hearts. And that heart now, when it's, when it's soft, it should be ready to be what? To be transformed for the mission of Imam Hussein. The mission of Imam Hussein. When we, when we begin now to, 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 to propagate and further, further along the mission of Imam Hussein, then maybe we've achieved some elitist status in the eyes of God. Then, be, then, then we have the beautiful right to call ourselves an azadar. I'm the one that grieves for Imam Hussein through my tears. I also grieved with him through my actions as well. <laughs> because what Imam Hussein sacrificed on the day of Ashura. Is very adim. And I mention this b- before every Messiah, only because I want myself to know how difficult this sacrifice was. And the way that the books describe certain events, I, I, I come to the conclusion, and not that I want to say I, I'm sorry, but it seems to me like, and of course I could be wrong, that one of the most difficult moments in this entire sacrifice of Karbala was when Imam Hussein had to 
give his Ali Akbar permission to go. His Ali Akbar. One of the hardest things that Imam Hussein had to do was watch his Ali Akbar ride into the Maidan of Karbala. He was such a proud father, such a proud father of Ali Akbar, such a proud father. When Ali Akbar was growing up, there would be a lineup outside the house of Imam Hussein. Lineup. For what? They just wanted to come and do ziyarat of Ali Akbar. They missed the Holy Prophet and they heard that this young man looked exactly like the Holy Prophet. So they wanted to do his ziyarat. And now this Ali Akbar stands in front of Imam Hussein and says, Baba, give me ijazat, Baba. My salams to the heart of Hussein. I asked my parents, I'm a parent as well. Your, your, your child comes to you and says, Baba, I want to go. You, you know that it's going to cause them pain. You look, look it's better, if you, better you don't go. Better that you don't go. Better that you don't go. You might drop this. You might hurt yourself. He knows that if my Ali Akbar goes into the Maidan of Karbala, I'll have to carry his Mayad back. <laughs> Imam Hussain says, Ali Akbar, I will give you ijazah. No problem. You go to the Khaimah of Puppy, your Puppy is lined up and ask her for her permission. Ali Akbar walks into the Khaimah of the women. Now the women are there. Then now they realize that Ali Akbar now is going into the Maidan of Karbala. There, there's the sound of tears now coming, crying from the Khaimah now. Somebody hu hugs Ali Akbar. Somebody now pulls him back. Every time the Khaimah would open, it would close. Open it, it would close. He wanted to leave, but they would pull him back. Where are you going, Ali Akbar? Where are you going, Ali Akbar? Every time we miss Rasulullah, we would look at you. <laughs> Finally, Ali Akbar now comes from the Khaimah. They're waiting to mount him on the horse, the heart of Hussein. Mount him on the horse is his father. Some say that Hussein took his arms out. Some say that he put his knee forward. Ali Akbar steps on the knee of his Baba, mounts the horse. Baba, my last khalaf is to you. My alvida to you, Baba. Imam Hussein says, go. But if you can, every so often as you ride into the Maidan of Karbala, just turn your face towards me. I just want to keep looking at your face and looking at your face and looking at your face. Ali Akbar now rides into the Maidan of Karbala, but he feels like there's somebody following him. He looks behind him, a 57-year-old grieving father, stumbling and chasing the horse. Ali Akbar gets off the horse, hugs his father. Baba, you gave me ijazat, Baba. You gave me ijazat, Baba. Imam Hussein, tears rolling down his face. If only you were sahib -e Olad Ali Akbar. If only you had a son like I have in you, you would know how difficult this moment is. Ali Akbar now rides into the, into, into the Maidan of Karbala. Ana Ali ibn al-Husayn ibn Ali. I am that Ali, the son of Hussein, the grandson of Amir al-Mu'mineen. He begins to fight like a Bani Hashim can only fight, begins to kill one by one. But this, these Mal'oon now uh, 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 ambush Ali Akbar. One now comes from behind Ali Akbar and strikes him in the chest with a spear and breaks the handle, the reports say. He now begins to fall from the horse, Ali Akbar. Alayka min Nisa. Salam, ya abata, accept my salam, O oh father, falls from the horse. Imam Hussein goes roaring inside the Maidan of Karbala, takes the cheek of Ali Akbar against his own cheek. Baba, there's pain in my chest, Baba. There's blood pouring from my chest, Baba. My Mullah Hussein lies down in his Javan Ali Akbar on the plains of Karbala, grabs the barichi and the spear, begins to pull the barichi out, but every time he does that, the body of Ali Akbar will go up and down, up and down the plains of Karbala. It's at that moment that Imam Hussein turns towards Najaf and says, Baba, are you watching what Hussein is doing? You rip the door of Khaybar. Come and take a barchi out of this Javan son's chest. Imam Hussein puts one knee on the chest of Ali Akbar, one foot on the plains of Karbala, grabs the barchi, says, Ya Ali, and rips the Say Allah, 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 Allah,
inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un ma tamahu sayyan ya hasan assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah